There was a time when there was a you, and you didn't have a physical body. There's reasonably good evidence that that is so. And this you that you are, that didn't have a physical body, wanted a physical body because you had something to express. Something to express, probably, that could be best expressed in this particular type of matter, this particular planet, in its particular relationship to other planets or bodies in this solar system, with its particular kinds of energies and its particular opportunities, for some reason there was an intelligence which pre-existed your body and knows how to make a body that wanted to express something in this earth in this time. Now maybe you don't buy that. It's quite all right. It might not be true. Frankly, in my opinion, it doesn't matter if it's true. What I would like to suggest that you do is make an assumption that that's the way it happened. Since we don't know any different, just start with an assumption and then see if the assumption works for you. I bet it will. So if you are adventurous, then begin with me with an assumption that there was an intelligence that pre-existed your physical body. That intelligence knows how to make a physical body. At least in the sense that that intelligence knows what it needs to express and its need expresses in matter. Now I suspect that at about the point that we have just described, you began to exert some persuasive thoughts upon someone who looked like a likely instrument through which you could express. In other words, very possibly at this point in time that we've just described, you started affecting your mother. Maybe your father. More likely your mother. And your mother forgot to take safety precautions because something in the back of her mind was longing to express herself, perhaps. Maybe it happened that way. And this creative consciousness that is you participating with your mother and your father built a physical instrument and entered into this reality and you began to experience sensory reality, physical reality, by using an instrument that you had created which has senses. And using that instrument you felt of the world around you. A bit of a shock at first, wasn't it? You don't remember? Well, it was. And probably the most important thing that happened early in your life is that as you experienced this reality through five sensory mechanisms which are not you but are tools available for your use and maybe you even had that perspective at that time you had five tools to use for experiencing matter and you used them and the interesting thing is every time you used them People came running to you and played with you and cuddled and touched you and tried to make you laugh and all of those things. You got all sorts of attention and then you would leave. You would close the sensory mechanisms for a moment because that tool is very cumbersome considering how expressive you are without the tool, 
that thing is a very cumbersome instrument for expression. And after all, you've known your mother for months already anyway. You've been communicating, you've been making her feel things, you've been leading her in directions and so on. Now, all of a sudden, she only pays attention to you when you use that silly instrument to communicate with her. And if you're not in the instrument, she simply ignores you as if you didn't exist. Remember? <laughs> and if you wanted to get her attention, you sort of tried to make her feel something. She paid no attention. She had other things to do. After all, she was tired by this point. And you tried to get her attention, tried to communicate with her, nothing happens, and finally, in utter disgust, you get that instrument again, and you rev it up, and you scream, and she comes running. And you find out that the way to get attention is to be uncomfortable. Screaming, making noise, using the physical, and if you don't use the physical, people will pretend that you don't exist. And so, the first thing that you were taught by people on this plane of reality is that you are a physical body. And without your body, you don't matter. And so you identified with matter as if that's what you are. Your instrument for expression became synonymous with you. And whatever happened to the instrument happened to you. And it became your belief that that is the only way to express, that is the only way to experience, either to receive or to communicate, and you also were taught that the best way to get loved is to cry and be uncomfortable and unhappy. Usually, when you were happy, your mother was happy that she could leave you alone and go do other things until you cried again. But crying always got attention for you. Being unhappy was your best means of making contact with other people in this world. Now, isn't that a rotten way to get started? Do you agree? I think we ought to practice some new techniques. I really do. I'm quite serious about this. Um, I think it's time for mothers who are expecting to work on their sensitivity. You know, you do have at least five more senses other than the external physical sen uh, senses that are properties of the physical material body. You have five more. Now, the interesting thing is that the other five are your original five. These five physical are the result of them. So the other five are more natural than these, if we're going to talk about natural senses. You are naturally, very naturally, clairvoyant. You are naturally clairsentient. You can see, you can hear, you can feel, you can smell and taste with subtler senses. And in fact, I'm quite sure that you do frequently. However, because of belief structures that we have built in this culture and habits that we have built in this culture, you probably neglect those five primal senses and use the five grosser senses to communicate untruthfully, which is what they're for. One of the early things that we learn is that we can communicate anything that we want to with the five gross senses, even if it isn't true. We learn that very early. And something that we also know inherently is that we can't do that with the subtler senses. 
You never ever tell a lie with the external senses without telling the truth at the same time with the subtler senses. And anyone who's paying attention can see it. You don't have to be terribly psychic to see when a person is telling the truth. We always give double messages if what we are communicating verbally is not true. Now probably the most interesting thing about that is that verbal communication is seldom true. We don't usually say what we mean in words. What we say in words is usually what we think that we're supposed to say under the circumstances. And we use inflections and body languages, eyes, and manipulations of subtle sorts to communicate what we really mean. Now, this isn't just sometimes. This is most of the time. Just greeting a person on the street very often communicates at least two messages. You see somebody coming, and of course, you wouldn't be so crass as to refuse to speak. But you see this person coming, and you don't particularly care how they are. But you spread on this smile that's only half real, and you say, hello, how are you? Delighted to see you while crossing your arms over your solar plexus as if to protect yourself, and turn your body away from them. I mean, anybody who can pay a little bit of attention and watch what you're saying on the other levels will notice that you're communicating on at least two levels. And both of them, of course, physical, using the voice to say what you're supposed to say, not what you mean. The inflection of the voice may be saying something totally different from the words, and the body, the physical body, may be saying something other than the words. And if a person is really listening, caring what you're thinking, they'll hear a lot more what's behind it. Communication is something that is going on constantly between us and other beings in our surroundings. Now, that may be family, it may be the people that we live with as a family, it may be people that we share space with closely, but you're communicating with people around you almost all the time. You communicate things from inside that you may never say or may never even express in body language. There is another level, a subtler level of communication that doesn't require either the physical body or the voice. We can call that psychic communication. I don't think it's a very good word because it implies all sorts of things that, uh, that seem supernatural. What we really should say is this. Your mind has field properties. Field properties means that a source of energy can affect something else, a receiver, at a distance without an obvious means of connection between the two. Your mind has field properties. It is capable of emitting energy which can be received over long distances and is received by anyone who makes himself or herself receptive on the same wavelength, if you'll pardon that expression. What that really means is this. If one of you, any one of you, should care about another person, and care what that person is thinking and how that person is feeling. And if you should care about what that person is thinking and how they're feeling more than you're caring about yourself, at any given moment, you will experience their thoughts and the way they feel. 
Telepathy is as simple as that. Now let's say it another way. If I want to know what you're thinking right now, all I really have to do is care more what you're thinking than what I'm thinking. And if I care more what you're thinking than what I'm thinking, I will give up my own thoughts, ideas, and opinions, and I will hear yours. Now, the interesting thing is, I may not know it. This kind of communication happens more often by accident than on purpose. People are too lazy to do it on purpose, but accidentally it works quite well. If you happen to care about another person, it usually happens, of course, when people fall in love. You notice a young man or a young lady suddenly notices somebody else, and suddenly all of the things that they were concerned with for months, maybe even years, suddenly don't matter. And for an extended period of time, that person, whatever they're doing on the job, at school, whatever, their mind is not with them. It's constantly, consistently, for an extended period, caring about someone else, curious about that other person and what they're thinking and feeling. That makes a person receptive. And as a matter of fact, the greatest evidence for that kind of communication is what is called sympathetic sickness. Have you ever heard of sympathetic sickness? Very often happens in young married couples. When the wife starts to get morning sickness, the husband gets sick. They meet each other at the emergency room. And uh, husbands sometimes even feel labor pains. The time of birth, I remember very well. If you learn to care what another person is thinking, you will make yourself receptive. Now, it isn't the easiest thing to do deliberately because when you start doing it deliberately, then your mind starts getting caught up in whether you're being successful or not, which means that your mind is on yourself again and not on the other person. In other words, the secret of it is a genuine caring. Not experimenting to prove a point, that seldom works but a genuine caring will cause you to be receptive, magnetically receptive. And being receptive, you will receive thoughts of people around you. Now, it isn't just being receptive deliberately that causes you to receive thoughts of others. It happens actually more simply than that not experiencing your own thoughts deliberately will often cause you to feel and experience the thoughts of others. Now, frankly, that's less healthy than do it, doing it on purpose, but it happens all the time. What I mean by that is this. There are two kinds of thinkers or two ways of thinking. One is a deliberate act of thinking which produces a positive polarity. The other is receptive or negative or feminine thinking, which happens very often just in the process of daydreaming or being empty in your consciousness. When you are empty in your consciousness, you are very vulnerable to thoughts of people around you. Now, it's easy to demonstrate. If um, for those of you who have been in inner light consciousness, um, you'll remember that we took you through a set of gardens. We didn't give those gardens any description except color. And we told you to build a temple. And we didn't give that temple a description as to type or color or size or whatever. You can build it any way you want to. But if you watch what happens when people go through this meditation exercise of building temples, Everyone in one portion of the room will build a temple just alike. People in proximi uh, proximity to one another will share thoughts. It always happens. Because some people are negative receptive thinkers and other people are masculine, overt, causative thinkers. So 
What we need to do, the point that I'm making for the moment is that you need to learn to take responsibility for communication, for what you're communicating on several levels. For what you are communicating and for the communication that you're receiving. There are two halves to every experience of communication. And that is what you're putting out and what you're receiving. Two halves make a whole. And every whole has a positive and negative polarity. Communication is like that. It has a positive and a negative half. The positive is what you are trying to put out and the negative is what you believe that you are receiving in response, which of course affects the next communication that you put out. So it's something that is happening rhythmically back and forth all the time when you are with other people. You may find it interesting that you are communicating with me now. And it makes quite a difference in what I'm communicating with you. What I'm communicating with you is built on what you're communicating with me. And it is my responsibility to respond to what you're saying. It's my responsibility to be sensitive to what you're saying. To what you are asking and what you are telling me about what I'm telling you. As a matter of fact, it's interesting to watch you do it. And I hope that you begin to get curious enough to watch each other do it. And to watch this happening in your own conversations. We want to take responsibility for being receptive and we want to take responsibility for active communication. Now, key to doing that is to realize that Verbal communication is probably the least important of all communication. It is no secret that people often don't believe what we said in words. We put out our words, people look at the way that we said them, the expression with which we said them, the conditions under which we said them, and even the way we worded our sentence, people listen to what we did not say to understand what we said. Now everybody knows that. But it's something that we need to get much more conscious of and much more responsible for. Because the secret to whole, responsible communication is integrity. The secret to responsible, whole communication is integrity. The word integrity is a variation of the word integral meaning one, not separated into two parts, not split from itself, and not doing or saying two things. Integrity in communication means getting in touch with what I really mean and admitting it to myself. People who lie in communication, and that's most everybody, usually lie first to themselves. I don't want to believe that I'm being dishonest with you, and so I will excuse myself by finding some reason for saying what I'm saying the way that I'm saying it. Society, of course, gives us all sorts of excuses. We base our communication on the fact, well, everybody else does it. Of course, I don't care how he's doing today. I just ask that because everybody asks it is polite. I mean, that's a reason for being dishonest. Right? Good reason? You're not the most responsive group of people I've talked with in a long time. We are going to make this a conversation, you know. Communication is two parts, you know. Integrity comes from examining myself and knowing who I am and what I'm trying to say and forming a right relationship with that. Now what that means is if I know that what I'm communicating is not acceptable then I am split from myself. I feel dishonest. And if I feel dishonest,
I'm going to say so on some level. This is the most interesting thing about human beings. They don't seem, we don't seem to be able to really lie on all levels. We seem to be so truthful at some level that every time we lie, we'll always say so. We'll use our body to indicate our discomfort with what we just said. And a person who is sharp will notice that he said something, but with his body he communicated that he wasn't comfortable with what he said. He did not communicate with integrity. Now, integrity comes from self-acceptance. I can communicate anything, anything that I really believe if I believe that it is all right to believe it. Now what I'm coming down to in cleaning up communication comes back to a theme that most of you have heard me harp on before. And I don't mind harping on this point because it is the point that we will be hammering away at all weekend. And it is this. If you are all right with you, if you have given you permission to think what you think, and if you have given yourself permission to communicate that, if you feel all right about yourself and your right to communicate and your right to think as you do, you will communicate with integrity. And all of your signals will say the same thing at the same time. And when all of your signals say the same thing at the same time, even people who don't know how to read the multi-level signals will notice something unusual about you. They will think that you communicate with confidence. Confidence is a result of integrity in thinking. Now, I'm not using integrity here in the moral sense. I'm not using it in the sense of saying that what I'm thinking the way that I think and what I believe agrees with what moral codes say that I should believe. I am not using integrity in that sense. As a matter of fact, that sense has damn little to do with integrity. Integrity means harmonizing with yourself on all levels, being one. And being one means that I can think a thought that you would consider immoral. And I can express that, as a matter of fact, I have fun with this quite frequently. I do things that just shock the dickens out of people who think that spiritual leaders are supposed to be certain ways, because I just don't happen to agree with the image that spiritual leaders are supposed to carry, which allows me to say things that will shock them and still have integrity, because it doesn't shock me. Because I have looked at what I'm communicating, and my belief about that is all right with me. I have found it acceptable. Now, it may violate other codes. It may violate other beliefs. But if I have formed a right relationship with me, if I have accepted me as an individual, and I have decided I'll take responsibility for what I communicate, I am willing to accept responsibility for what it does, then I can communicate what I feel instead of communicating what I think I'm supposed to say under certain conditions while thinking, I wish I didn't have to say that. And sending out this double message, this multi-level message. We create in ourselves and our children at a very, very early age this business of communicating one thing while believing another and telling our children at the same time, you are supposed to be honest. Now, of course, we don't say certain things in front of her. You know, we say that we believe something else when the preacher is here. 
You know, we don't use that kind of language when certain people are here. We teach ourselves and we teach our children that it is all right to lie, except that we also teach that it is not all right to lie, and that double message gets caught in the physical body. It is not possible to communicate a lack of integrity without tightening muscles. And the place where you tighten the muscles will very often have to do with the subject that you're communicating about. If you happen to be talking about sex and moral considerations, you're going to tighten muscles in the thighs and the lower abdomen. Likely. If it is about um, your job, I mean, how often do... Here's something that I see all the time, so I think it's something that you might relate to. I see people who spend a lot of time on the job and feel unproductive. They're not sure that they got their job done, so they work overtime. Not because they had to, but because they feel guilty about not getting more done because they were confused, not busy. And then they work overtime and overtime and overtime, put in lots and lots of hours. They got nothing in particular done, but then they begin to feel put upon for working all those hours and not getting attention, so they begin to communicate. Look how hard I'm working. Now there's something in them that is doubting whether they got anything done, but they do want attention for working, and so their communication is done through tight lips with tight shoulders. They are shouldering a burden, and they have conflict about their belief about the burden. So what's happening? My concern in communicating this to you is on several levels. One is in getting communication straight and honest between us. If I could suggest to a small family here or anywhere else that we begin to communicate with integrity and give one another permission to do so, and more important than that, give ourselves permission to do so, it's going to be like letting us out of prison. It's going to affect the physical body, it's going to affect the face, the muscles of the face, the facial structure. It will affect the, the muscles of the jaws, in particular, the grinding of the teeth. It will affect the vertebra of the back of the neck. It will affect the muscles across the shoulders. It will affect the muscles all up and down the back. And when you affect all of that, you affect your heart, lungs, kidneys, endocrine glands, etc., etc., etc. I mean, you can go on and on and on. What I'm really saying is, if I could just get you to communicate with integrity, miracle healings would start to take place in this group. Being honest with yourself will heal you. Believe it. It'll heal you. Where do you start? Getting honest with yourself and communicating with integrity. I think the first thing is to look at yourself. I mean, fairly honestly. Look at yourself. Get in touch with yourself and how you feel about you and about what you've been saying to people around you. The majority of meaningful, effective communication in your life right now is done with your emotions, not with your words. Betcha. The way that you communicate to your husband or wife or family, the way that you communicate how you feel is not with words. It's with your emotions. And people around you find out what you are trying to say, not with your words. Because often you don't even use them when you're trying to communicate a thought, right? You use your emotions, and your emotions are expressed through the way that you use your body. So you use your physical body and your emotions to manipulate people around you and to tell them that you are feeling good 
or bad, or you need this, you need that. You manipulate people with your emotions, and in doing that, you try to communicate your needs. Now, it isn't a very accurate way of communicating. We fall silent in order to say, I need attention. Our partner sees us fall silent and says, uh-oh, she's mad. It's not a very good means of communication, but I bet you do it a lot. Get in touch with yourself and how you're communicating. And what we're going to do with the pen and paper right now is begin to list some important ways that we communicate. And the first thing I'd like you to do is list a time that you can remember recently when someone close to you used manipulation to communicate their feelings to you. They manipulated you in order to let you know something about them. Try to remember the last time that you were manipulated by someone close to you. Somebody set up a situation deliberately, not because they had to, but because they were trying to tell you something. Remember? Hasn't been long ago. Just put down a couple of words that will remind you of that situation. The last time that you were manipulated in order to tell you something, to get a message across to you. Somebody manipulated a situation in order to communicate with you. You were set up. And you may have known it. Probably did. Now, the next thing I'd like you to list is the last time you did that to someone else. The most recent time that you can remember deliberately creating a situation which may or may not have been honest, but you created a situation to tell somebody something that you did not want to tell them in words. Remember? That hasn't been long ago either. All right. After you have listed those two things, the third thing that I'd like you to list is the last time that you remember noticing that somebody was telling you something with their body that was different from what they were telling you with words. You know, this evening is an interesting study in communication while we're talking about communication. Our communication changes as we begin to get comfortable with each other. One question that we haven't answered yet is just exactly what is communication? I think the best way to say it is this. Communication is a multi-level sexual relationship. <laughs> looked at some of you looked as if I hit you when I said that. <laughs> Communication is a multi-level sexual relationship. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Um, when I use the word sex, we are going to go beyond uh, in this workshop all weekend. We're going to be using sex in a more universal sense than uh, genital relationships. So we're not talking about physical genital relationships. What we're talking about is polarity. Sex means the interaction of a positive with a negative, whether we're talking about metals, whether we're talking about atoms, whether we're talking about molecules, amoebas, animals, or humans, or even ideas. When a positive and a negative interact, you have a sexual relationship. Is that right? Communication is a positive interacting with a negative, which may happen on several different levels, and it may be positive on one level and negative on another at the same time. 
So the important thing to realize is that you are a multi-level being. You are not just a physical body. That is an instrument, but it isn't all that you are. But when you communicate, you do use all that you are so that on several different levels you are having an interaction. You may be expressing an idea in words and receiving energy to an emotion that you're feeling on a totally different level. In other words, you are with words expressing anger. Now when you express that anger, the person that you're expressing it to is acceptably contrite. So you receive satisfaction while expressing anger. That's a sexual relationship. Got it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Expressing anger verbally may very well be a positive or a masculine uh, communication. You are putting out energy verbally. Because of the way your energy is affecting another person, you receive satisfaction from the fact that that person is communicating back to you what you want in return. So you are receiving feminine. That feminine receiving is causing a result in you. So the feminine conceived and gave birth to a new feeling. So there are three things happening. You put out a masculine, you received feminine, you incubated that and put out a new emotion as a result of it. That's a multi-level sexual relationship. If we begin to realize that you are not male or female, you are androgynous. Your physical instrument is expressing as male or female in this particular experience because that suits the needs of this experience for you. That body is the most helpful for what you came to do, but it isn't what you are. And what you are is an androgynous being with masculine and feminine qualities capable of conceiving, incubating, and giving birth to ideas, emotions, expressions, all sorts of things, creativity, all sorts of things on many different levels. And communication is the act of having productive relationships on subtle and gross levels, or either subtle or gross levels. Communication is the act of becoming masculine in order to uh, impregnate a feminine receptor, which may be in a masculine body, by the way, to produce a result from that. Is that too much sex for you? In one night? It's right Freudian for New Age people, isn't it? That's all right. Freud wasn't all bad. Um, okay, the act of becoming masculine in order to impregnate a feminine receiver with an idea or a thought, an image, um, in order to produce a result which is offspring of the action. Or the opposite of that. In communication, I can either be uh, male on one level and female on another, or female on both levels, or male on both levels, and so on, or any combination of those. So it is a relationship that hopefully will give birth, but may abort. Consider that possibility too, it very often does. I still see head shaking. That's a lot to digest all in one minute there, isn't it? Okay. Now. Just consider that as an idea, because it's an intriguing thing to play with for a while. 
this thought that we are masculine and feminine on many different levels and that we are constantly having relationships which produce results which are essentially sexual or reproductive if you don't want to use that word sexual they are reproductive in nature our relationships with one another uh, carried on at the level of communication, any kind of communication. Has it ever occurred to you that conversation is called intercourse? Social intercourse, of course. It's very apt, actually. Now, we grow up in a culture that tells us it is not nice to love yourself. It's not nice to feel good about who you are and what you are. And at the same time, we are beings that have a very deep need, an appetite, an emptiness, a hunger. Most of the hungers that we recognize are result hungers. In other words, our bodies have needs. That is a result of being physical. But there is a cause hunger as well as result hungers. Body needs are result hungers. Physical sexual needs are result hunger. Uh, physical appetite for food needs are a result hunger. They are a result of using a physical body. There is a cause hunger. The cause hunger is a need for love. Now by love I don't mean just acceptability. By love I mean the feeding of one another with available energy that allows us to have a mutual intercourse, not necessarily on the physical level. There is a cause hunger, and our cause hunger is for love. Now say it another way. Every living being, every human being, has a deep-seated need to be loved. And if a being does not feel loved, that being will go to drastic lengths to get a love substitute. There are many substitutes for Love, among them, are sympathy, hate, rejection, disapproval. The one thing that human beings can tolerate least is being ignored, indifference. We want either love or hate because love and hate are really the same thing. Keep in mind, hate is not the opposite of love. Indifference is the opposite of love. Hate is love expressed violently or expressed with disapproval. You can't hate someone you don't care about. And that caring is what love is all about. People have a need to be cared about, even if that is expressed in anger, disapproval, uh, resentment, sympathy, or other ways. We have a need for someone else to care that we exist. Now, because of that, we enter into strange relationships. All of our relationships, all of your relationships, and all of your communication centers around love and acceptance. Now because we have, have this extremely exaggerated need for love, our communication and our relationships are affected. They are results of a need for love. There is no hope of understanding communication, relationships, or sex without getting in touch with what love is and how great is the need for love. You need to be loved. And it is a desperate need. It is a need that you cannot deny. And if you try to deny it, you will have psychotic responses. 
so will others. But even in your psychotic responses, you'll still seek it. Okay? You need to be loved. And your relationship to being loved will affect all of your communication. And as a matter of fact, every time you communicate, even if it's to ask for a glass of water or to say hello, you will make a statement in that communication about your current love relationship. Every time you communicate, you reveal your current need for love or the satisfaction of that need. In other words, your current status in relationship to being loved is communicated in every communication that you make. Now again, I want to keep saying this, and I want you to hear me when I say this. What I just said may not be true. I can't prove it. I'm speaking from my observation. So I am not prepared to prove it. I'm not going to give you any figures that will prove that every time you communicate, you make a statement about whether you're loved or not. I simply will say this. It is my opinion, my belief, based on what I see when people communicate, that they never leave that out. Someone says hello to me. I've never seen him before. I can tell you in a skinny minute their relationship to love. Whether they are loved or not, whether they feel they are loved or not, how deep is their need for love, whether they are receiving it, and how they feel about receiving it, whether they feel worthy of it. For that reason, I believe that you communicate it all the time. In every relationship, in every communication, it is the basis for communication itself. Communication is basically a sexual relationship based upon your relationship to love itself. Your greatest need as a being is to love and be loved. It's what you're all about, and the physical body is only an instrument for the expression of that, loving and being loved. It is an instrument for communication and for relationships. It is built for communication and for relationships. But it is a result. Love is the cause. Now, you are a cause being expressing through a result of what you have caused. You are a cause, a creator. You, the creator, have caused a body to exist. That body is caused by your creativity and reflects it which means that your body in its shape, in its appearance, in all things about it, reflects the nature of its cause. It is a result of a cause, and being a result of a cause, it perfectly reflects that cause, which means that you can know yourself by studying your body, but that's not because your body is what you are. It's because your body is a result of what you are. You can know yourself by studying your body in the same way that you can know a painter by studying his painting. He will reveal in it what he is. Now, your cause. You have caused a body. In that body you have expressed yourself. You have expressed your feeling about yourself and about others. And you use that body and the personality that is also a result. Now, let's get in touch with those two factors for a moment. You created a body that is a result of what you are and the way that you think. In that body, you formed relationships very early. And in those relationships, you accepted beliefs. Beliefs that were communicated to you by others. And you did one or two things with those beliefs. You either accepted them as they were communicated to you, or you rejected them. Neither on a rational basis, necessarily. You accepted them or rejected them probably on the basis of how you felt, which means that you accumulated a set of beliefs and reactions 
communicated to you by your parents, by your friends, by people that you grew up with, and that collection of beliefs and descriptions of you is called a personality. It is not your personality. It is a collection of beliefs and descriptions given to you by people who are around you as you grew up. It is a result of your relationships and the relationships of others. It's borrowed, it is not you, it is not yours. And probably doesn't serve you very well. It is probably made up of a host of irrational beliefs. Your personality stinks. <laughs> now, I feel free to say that because I have so rarely seen anyone whose personality served them consistently. Because the person who works on examining the personality, the set of beliefs, and whether they work or not, is a rare person. It takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of dedication, takes a lot of commitment, and it's what spiritual growth is all about. Cleaning up your set of beliefs which results in a personality. Your personality is probably made up of manipulative devices to get what you want from others, which would be all right, except that what you want is usually based on false beliefs about your own needs. So that you are getting things by manipulation which don't serve you when you get them. Did you follow all that? <laughs> okay. Your personality is made up of a set of irrational beliefs that are given to you and me, to us, by an irrational society. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. You take those irrational beliefs about yourself. For example, that it's not nice to love yourself. That if you really want something that somebody else has, you're not supposed to say so. You're supposed to get them to give it to you without admitting that you really wanted it. How many times have you done that recently? Uh, I mean, the very basic belief of that is that you're not supposed to be honest. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, we're literally taught that we are not supposed to be honest. It's not nice to be honest. I mean, it's impossible not to have a need to love yourself, but it's not nice to love yourself. How irrational is that? So we have all these irrational beliefs which cause us to manipulate others to get them to do for us what we want done but which we do not want to admit that we want done. Who started all this? Okay, this is a good question. Who started all of this? Um, you really want to go back that far? Um, the story that I have heard is this. There was a time when none of us occupied physical bodies, and yet we existed. But I couldn't really tell the difference between me and you, because we had a tendency to interchange thoughts, and I never really knew whether it was my thought or your thought, until we decided to experience matter. And when we experienced matter, we learned that in this particular planet of polarity that things separate in order to multiply and reproduce. And being curious about that kind of experience, you and I separated into male and female halves. So I experienced being one half of the whole that I once was. And experiencing being that half, I also now realized that if you and I both get terribly curious about that grape and how it tastes, then we have a conflict of interest. Which means that the next step is 
that in order to serve my interests, which I now believe are different from yours, there's the first irrationality that crept in, and that is what is classically called the fall. At the moment that I noticed that grape and realized that one or the other of us could have it, but not both of us, and my belief about myself was that my interest competes with yours, and as a result of that, I decided to build into me weapons for survival, size, manipulative ability, and so on, this separateness and this competitiveness affected the whole of Earth. According to the ancient teachers, in that second, roses grew thorns, bees developed stingers, and animals became competitive. The whole Earth was affected by the thought of the Creator called mankind. Now, that may not be true, but there's reasonably good evidence that that's true. And perhaps that's where it all started. We started with an irrational thought. The irrational thought was that your interests com uh, um, compete with mine. That is not accurate. It isn't true. As a matter of fact, my interest is yours. It is in my interest to support you and keep you alive. Because you are a source of what I need more than I need that grape. I need your approval. I need your acceptance. I need your love. Now, more than I need your love, I simply need love which is the point that I think is most important for us to arrive at tonight. I need love. Not necessarily your love. I need love. The most important love for me to receive is my own love, because if I do not accept me, if I don't love me, I will not let you love me either because it will produce a conflict in my belief system. If I don't love me, then I have a belief that I am not lovable, that I am not lovely, that I am not to be loved. And if you love me, it will cause me to feel as if I'm lying, which means that I will begin to sabotage our love relationship by communicating to you things that will make it very difficult for you to love me. Do you ever watch people doing that? Yourself, maybe? Sabotaging relationships? We do it all the time. We take a person and get them to love us and then feel guilty about it and start telling them, I'm not really what you think I am. When you find out what I really am, you're not going to love me. But you better, because I need you. And we start sending these conflicting messages. Now, the conflict is not just in my communication with you. The conflict is in me. And the conflict can only be ended by starting with my relationship with self. I have built a body, and through that body I have accumulated a personality. And I use that body and personality in order to communicate and form relationships, to gather experience, and to accomplish growth and understanding. Now, if I can look at what I've created, the body first, if I look at the body and develop a healthy relationship with my body. Now, by a healthy relationship with my body, I don't mean that it has to become healthy first. I mean a healthy relationship with my body as it is now, which means this. My body may be fat or thin, physically functioning excellently in good physical health or very poor, but whatever my body is, it is a perfect expression of what I have told it to do, which means that whatever the condition of my physical body at this moment 
it is, in fact, perfect. We, we refuse to believe the validity of experiences based on what is acceptable in our society. Uh, people agree that they don't see things and they forget seeing them. Uh, because that they're told that it's impossible. There is a great need for acceptability because love is tied to it. And so we will conform even if that means a destruction of a great part of ourselves in order to get love. Which is why I keep coming back to this first point. You need to be loved. There's no doubt about it. It is probably the greatest need that you have you will go to great lengths to satisfy that need. The need is not easily satisfied and must be satisfied over and over and over again unless it is satisfied properly. And properly satisfied means this. There is a specific sequence that you need to follow in developing a right relationship with love. And that is, number one, Accept responsibility for what you have built. Now that means your body and your personality, your set of beliefs and all that you identify as self. Accept responsibility for it and accept that it is all right. It is a perfect response to what you have created, and in that sense at least, on that level at least, it is perfect. It is perfect in that it is a perfect response. Now that means you have available to you a very intricate, delicate, complicated mechanism that is spectacularly impressive. Your physical body. It is responsive, it is delicate, it is extremely compl complicated, and it is obedient to you. That's impressive. Accept it. Accept your physical body as being an excellent vehicle to communicate what you are. Perfect for communicating what you are and what you think. Accept that and give it your approval. In whatever condition that it is, give it your approval. Now you'll have to give it your approval if you want to change it. So if that's difficult for you, that's the first place that you need to work. You need to work on how you feel about your own body. Now there are specific ways to do that. One of the ways is this. If you disapprove of your body, you probably disapprove of it on aesthetic grounds. It is not as attractive as I would like it to be. It's not as beautiful as I would like it to be. If you have some difficulty with that, I'd like for you to take a look for a moment at beauty and what it, in fact, is. We have associated beauty in our culture with aesthetics, that is bone structure, shape, complexion, and so on. That's irrational. I'll tell you why it's irrational. You can take a person who has all of those qualities, the Hollywood syndrome, all of those qualities of physical appearance that are supposed to project beauty, and you can notice that that person is not projecting something that makes me feel better. If so, that person is not projecting beauty. On the other hand, you can take a strangely misshapen, ugly, gnarled little old man. Something that doesn't match Hollywood's image of beauty at all. And you can take that person and have that person communicate joy, laughter, acceptance, and love, and you'll see beauty. Beauty is a living thing made of communication and through the use of your instrument. You have an instrument, you have a body that is capable of communicating beauty. You have a beautiful body.
Now, you don't have to believe that if you don't want to, but if you don't believe it, you'll have to live with the results of not believing it. And the choice is yours. And personally, I believe that you have a beautiful body. I'm not supposed to say that to you guys in this culture. But I have integrity. And with integrity, I do say that. And to heck with culture. I think you have a beautiful body. <laughs> okay, now, your personality is a collection of beliefs and that can be changed. And, uh, and I think that the beauty of accepting yourself and loving yourself is in the ability to change your personality and your beliefs, which will in turn change your body. Your physical body will change as a result of changing your beliefs. You can literally make yourself aesthetically more beautiful. So if you think, oh, I have to settle for being beautiful by beaming at people, I'm not really saying that. I am saying that you start being beautiful by communicating beauty, and when you do, the physical body will change in response to it. Okay? You begin building a beautiful body by using your body to communicate beauty. Communicating beauty through your body will change the body. And it will become physically, aesthetically, more beautiful as a result of it. I mean, you should have seen me five years ago. I mean, you know, you think I'm good looking now, just wait till next year. I'm considerably better looking than I used to be. Well, you just didn't see what I used to look like. <laughs> doing pretty good considering. You can, in fact, make yourself more beautiful physically. You can recreate your personality and you can recreate your body, but you don't do it by disliking what you have. You cannot dislike what you have because you have created it. It is a perfect expression of you. Accept it. Own it. Take responsibility for it. And taking responsibility for it, congratulate yourself. Don't disapprove. Don't get into that or you've got the cycle going and you'll have to live with the disapproval. The disapproval will manifest through you. It will show. You will have to live with the result and you will further disapprove. It's a vicious cycle. So the place to start is to accept what you are right now as being a perfect expression of a creator. Now, even if you have created a mass of ugliness, you have created, you are a creator, and you can change your creation, but you have to own it first. It is raw material, so accept it as that and love it as that. I love the fact that I have a blob of flesh that is a perfect expression of the creative me, and I can own that, and whatever I've made of it at the moment is of the moment, and I can reshape that, I can make it more beautiful by taking responsibility for it. Both physical body and personality. I will own it, I will love it. I will love it enough to make it mine and expressive of me. And by expressing beauty through it, I will expect it to begin to change. Now once again, we can come back to saying all of this may not be true. I only suggest that it is true because it gives you a chance to do something about you. Just on the chance that you need to. Your best chance for recreating you is to own what you are now. The body that you have made, the mind that you have created, that you have built, the personality that you have built, take responsibility for it in this moment. Don't listen to the psychologists that tell you it's your mother's fault, it's the way she potty trained you. Forget that stuff. Your mother had her own problems and so did her mother and her mother's mother. 
What you have right now is a result of your expression of yourself. Own it. Take your body and say, whatever is not pleasing about it is because I haven't finished manipulating this piece of clay yet. It is mine, it is me, and I will make it beautiful. But I have to love this pliable piece of flesh that is an expression of me. I will love it and express the love of it through it and produce more beautiful result. Same thing with my personality. Now, people who don't like their own personality, feel guilty about it, feel that it isn't serving them well in all this business, resent the fact that it isn't all right and show that in ugly ways to others. They fail to project the beauty that is inherent within them. Your communication is a result of what you are and your beliefs about it and has little to do with what you think you're communicating about. Forget all the superficial stuff up here, all of the passing the time of day and impressing each other with what books we have read and what we know. So interesting to have people come up on the break and start telling me things about who they have studied with and what their background is and all these things that are supposed to impress me. And of course, I never hear what it is that they did. What I hear is this person is trying to impress me which means that this person doesn't believe what they're telling me. If they believed that they were acceptable, they wouldn't be giving me this crap. They'd be presenting themselves as they are without any need to say, I studied with so-and-so, I have done this, I have that background, I'm a yoga teacher, I'm this, I'm that, whatever. Just, I'm me, and I love you. Just right up front. People don't tell me that very often unless I give him permission. You have permission. <laughs> and sometimes even when they do, they say it, you know, like, I love you. Like, is that all right? I mean, you know, I don't know if you want my love or not. That's body language. You got that? Did you, did you watch it. Watch what people are communicating on the various different levels. It's all right to be you and to assume. Your love feels good to you. When you accept yourself and love yourself, that feels good. It feels good to feel all right about me, about who I am, about what I am. And that alone is a good enough reason for doing it. I love me because it feels good to love me. Now that's step one. When I find out how good my love is, I am no longer ashamed to give it to you. I know it's good. And I know, I know that if you're capable of receiving it, you'll find out how good it is too. And if you don't receive it, it is not because my love isn't good. It's because you haven't learned how to receive it yet. You haven't recognized it. So if I love you, and you don't accept that love and love in return, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with me. You hear that? Therefore, I don't have to be afraid to love you. I can love you just wide open. I know that my love is good, and if you receive it, you're lucky. I know, of course, that I'm lucky to receive it, too. I'm lucky that I have my love, and you're lucky if you have my love, and I'm fortunate if I have your love, and if you can receive my love, then that's your blessing. You'll enjoy it, and so will I. And if you don't receive my love, that's unfortunate for you. And for me, it may be a disappointment, but it does not mean that I am not acceptable. And it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with my love, and it also doesn't mean that I stop loving you. 
I'm going to do it, whether you like it or not. And I'm going to assume that when you learn to recognize it, that you will like it, then you will accept and enjoy what I'm putting out. And at that moment, if we never touch physically, we still have had a sexual relationship. You have received the energy that I have put out. I have received the energy that you have put out. I have been feminine to you. You have been feminine to me. I have been masculine to you. You have been masculine to me. And the two of us will give birth to a beautiful relationship. The question is, why are people so afraid both to love and to be loved? When people try to love, people are scared of it. Since we have such a deep need for it, why are people afraid of what they need? People are afraid because we have been taught in our irrational culture that when people express love, they're up to something. Couldn't be honest. I mean, it couldn't be just direct, outright love. This culture is really interesting. If a man expresses love to a man, that man's going to think he's a pervert. And if he expresses love to a woman, better be careful she's not married. Or someone's daughter, or whatever. There are all these implications of impropriety in directness about communicating acceptance and love. And it doesn't happen to it doesn't have to happen in threatening ways and the threat is removed when you do this. First of all, people who love themselves are not threatened by love from others. You can receive if you accept yourself. If you do not accept yourself, you'll be threatened by almost everyone's love because there's an implication that Someone loves me because they want something from me. And the threat is that you'll take away something of mine, some vague something, I don't know quite what it is. You're going to take my love. I can't afford to let you take my love because I haven't even had it myself yet. That's what it boils down to. That's why love is threatening. We have taught ourselves and our children it's not all right to love yourself. We need to reverse this, especially in relationship to children. Teach children, you are beautiful. And it's all right to know that. And when you know that, when you know that you are beautiful, that you are loved, that you are acceptable, then you can love others freely without being afraid that they won't accept it, without being afraid that they're going to use it. Of course they're going to use it. And it's all right. A confidence in self and a confidence in others. We are caught up with rules that have come from a Victorian morality that is based on denial of truth. Denial of the fact that we are, in fact, reproductive sexual beings. We are supposed to hide our genitals. We're supposed to pretend that our bodies are shaped differently than they are. We're supposed to believe that certain parts of the body are sacred and other parts are evil. That certain parts are clean and other parts are dirty. You know, Dr. Parker from the University of Redlands was once lecturing on this very subject with relation to children. And he pointed out that we always tell little boys, wash your hands after you go to the bathroom, especially before you eat. And then there was a study, of course, that showed that there are something like three times as many um, unhealthy germs in the mouth as on the penis. And he suggested that we start teaching our little boys to wash their hands after eating and before going to the bathroom. All this business about the genitals being unclean has nothing to do with sanitary conditions. It has nothing to do with germs. It has to do with beliefs and morality. 
denial of what we are, the very nature of our beings, and our threatening love relationships, our being threatened by love, is based on those irrational beliefs that have come out of that. And even discussing these things is so difficult, even for adults, even in California. <laughs> Having come out of this most recent past, there's just a lot of stuff that we haven't gotten out, we haven't taken a good look at, we haven't exposed it to sunlight, which cleanses anything. Got that? <laughs> and as a result of not being honest with who we are and what our needs are, we have built these fears, we have communicated them to one another, and we have found love threatening. Now, I think that's as much as we're going to say for the moment about communication. And tonight is just a kind of an introduction, just to plant some seeds, some ideas. Tomorrow morning we're going to plant some more seeds and ideas and just throw some thoughts out. And as we go along we'll get more into what to do with those thoughts and how to change some of our relationships, some really practical ways to develop some new beliefs and some new practices that are going to work for us in communication and in sexual relationships, in love relationships, in relationship with self and source of being. So we'll start with just these ideas that we've put out tonight. I'd like for you to sort of uh, digest that overnight. And we'll start there in the morning with beginning to talk about what sex is and, um, and how it's used effectively.